Am I the greatest? And how can I know? Uh, do you ever ask yourself that? Well, you're going to say, no, no, of course I don't, Doug. Um, I, I know I'm not the greatest. Um, I'm not trying to be the greatest, whatever that, that means. It's a bit vague, isn't it? The greatest. Sounds like a rather childish argument, doesn't it? Um, we read in verse 46, an argument arose among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. It really does sound like something that children would argue about in the playground, doesn't it? You know, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. No, you're not. Well, my dad could beat up your dad. You know, that kind of childish sort of toing and froing. I mean, who really argues about who's the greatest? It sounds more like something we'd see on, you know, Colin McGregor on UFC and, you know, all these guys, you know, macho, I'm the greatest. And so it'd be easy for us to dismiss this as just a childish conversation and think that really we're not in any danger of repeating it. Because I, I never think in those terms, I never think in those ways. But actually, uh, we do. We'll see in just a minute that this isn't just a random kind of vacuous conversation, but this is a deep revealing of the apostles' hearts. And actually, we reveal our hearts in attitudes like this all the time. Maybe we don't start an argument with our friends uh, or colleagues or brothers and sisters about who is the greatest. Maybe we don't ask ourselves, you know, am I the greatest and how would I know? But we do ask questions like, am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough? Am I intelligent enough? Am I successful? Am I liked? Am I talented? Do I fit in? Those sorts of questions do go through our minds, don't they? How am I doing at whatever it may be? And the only way to answer those questions about how am I doing at or is to look at, well, where do I stack up? That's the only way we can know. Where do I rank? Where do I fit in the scale? And what is the scale? Well, it's the people around me. So, am I pretty? Well, well how do I know? Well, what do other people think of me? And what do I think of other people? And, and do I think I'm prettier than that person? Or, or how can I get them to affirm me? Uh, assure me that I'm pretty? Or, or who is the, is the most successful? I will say things like, well, don't you, you, he's only got all of that because, well, actually... He was given, he was given money. You know, I've worked for everything I've got. I'm more, he may look more successful, but I'm more, I've, done, I've had more success. You know exactly what it is. Even, even like a level down from that to, you know, execute. We're all so good, aren't we, at the humble brag. You know it. Where you want other people to know how great you are, but you don't want them to know that's what you're doing. But everyone knows that is exactly what you're doing. Uh, and someone will be like, you know, even something as silly as like, you know, oh, I'm so tired, you know. Uh, work last week was just so busy. And then someone else replies, oh, yeah, no. They, they look like they're you know, being sympathetic and like, oh, yeah, no, I totally know what you mean. Because, yeah, I had a really busy work like that. And I also was up all night with the baby. Or I also had this extra big project from my boss. I also had to you know, go and look after my parents. And you might think that you fooled everyone into just like you've just innocently joined in the conversation, you've shown some sympathy and shown how we're very similar. But everyone's heard loud and clearly what you've said is shut up. You don't know what tired is. I have more reason to be tired. Therefore, my, your tiredness is invalidated and I'm better than you because I don't make a fuss about it. Even though you just did. And we do those sorts of things all the time, don't we? Over silly things like that. I'm the most humble. I'm the most generous. I'm the most hardworking. I have things the hardest. And it's strange, but... We know that whenever we say stuff like that, what we're really saying is, I'm greater than you. I'm better than you. And let there be no confusion. Everyone else completely understands what, that's what you're saying as well. I just want us to understand in, in saying that, I just want us to understand that this is not a weird conversation between the disciples. 
This is not unknown to us. It is a playground conversation, but it's also an office conversation and a classroom conversation and a coffee shop conversation and a living room conversation. And sadly, all too often, it's a church conversation. But why, why do we do it? Why do we do this? Because we know, like, when we do it, we catch ourselves, there's part of us that loathes that we just did it. So why do we do it? Well, pride. Pride. I, I want people to know what my life is really like. I want them to know how hard I really work. And I, need, I want to get some, you know, I need some validation that I believe that I need and I deserve. Sometimes it's insecurity, you know. Well, no one else is going to mention it. No one else is going to praise me, so I'm going to bring it up. I better do it. I want people to like me. And by the way, insecurity and pride are really just two sides of the same coin. They're exactly the same thing. People who come across proud and struggle with pride are usually incredibly insecure. And equally, people who are insecure and always put themselves down Actually, the root issue is pride. And so you see, the danger this morning is to think, having said all that, is to think, well, this sermon is for other people. Because, oh, if this sermon is about thinking less of myself, well then, I'm good, because I actually kind of loathe myself. I actually think quite lowly about myself. So I can just zone out this morning, because this is for people who think they're great. But I don't think I'm great. I don't think I'm pretty or successful or worthy. And maybe you don't think those things, but you do spend a lot of time thinking about yourself in those categories. You do think about yourself a lot, even if it is only as self-loathing and wishing you were better. You see, the thing is we are obsessed with ourselves. We're obsessed with our problems, our failings, and our greatness. And we just need to be freed from self-obsession and self-importance. And so the aim is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. There's a big difference between those two things. It's not to think less of yourself, but just to think of yourself less. So let's get into what's going on here with the disciples and we'll see these things come out. Because this isn't just a big ego sesh. This isn't a conversation that's just come out of thin air, has it? It's based on what's just happened. It seems pretty clear, doesn't it, that this whole argument is about the disciples not being able to cast out the demon while Jesus was up the mountain. Um, and we've shown that even more clearly in that John's answer, he answers Jesus, doesn't he? So Jesus kind of rebukes them, corrects them, and John answers. And his answer in verse 49 is about this guy who can cast out a demon. So this is what it's all about. This whole disagreement is about who can do it, who can cast out demons. And we can imagine, we can imagine, can't we? It's not hard to imagine. Like Peter and John and James, they come down the mountain and Peter is like, uh, what do you mean you couldn't do it? What do you mean you couldn't cast out a demon? And like, I'm, I'm telling you, Peter, you, you don't know what was going on. We did everything we were meant to do, but it didn't work. And Peter's like, well, if I had been here, I totally would have cast out that demon. Like, no, 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 you wouldn't, Peter. What makes you think you're so much better than us? Well, says Peter, I was the one who went up the mountain with Jesus. I was chosen. And then they're off, aren't they? Now, that's speculation as to how that conversation went, but I'm I'm not willing to bet, but I would would imagine it was not far from that, right? Because they're humans, and that's how humans behave. Posturing and pride and putting each other down uh, that's how we think we, we, need, we need to maintain our image and our position. We have this deep need to be validated and to lift ourselves up and to control the image that's put out there of us and, and what people think of us. And the disciples are not immune to any of that, and neither are we. What makes this worse is the context in which it is said. Like, what has Jesus just said? So the disciples have been unable to cast out this demon, okay? And then Jesus comes and does it for them. So does something they can't do. Um, and then he says, I'm going to suffer and die. I'm going to be handed over to, to evil men. And they decide that's a perfect time to have an argument about who's better. But who's the greatest. I mean, talk about being tone deaf. Because none of them are great. None of them are great. Peter might be, you know, might be right in criticising them for not being able to cast out a demon. 
but like this dude just fell asleep during a prayer meeting. <laughs> like, come on, do you know what I mean? He's not great either, is he? None of them are great. And yet Jesus is this one who stood in front of them, like casting out a demon up all night praying, talking to Moses and Elijah. The father goes, this is the guy. And he stood right in front of them and like, they're like, oh, we're great. It's, it's tone deaf, isn't it? And they don't understand what Jesus has said about suffering and dying. But in verse 45 we read last week, instead of like applying some thought to what Jesus just said and, and being reflective and thinking and even asking Jesus, like, hey, what do you mean? Um, are you okay? I'm concerned about what you just said. For you, you know, are you going to die? What's that about? But instead they immediately are thinking about their own image and their own problems and where they rank and their shuffling. And it isn't alien to us at all, is it? As we read this, we're like, oh my goodness, guys, how could you do that? They immediately go from hearing Jesus speak about the cross to thinking of themselves and their ego. But haven't we all done this? Don't we all struggle with this? Monday morning, back in the office, the school run, the classroom, the shop, whatever it might be. It was only yesterday that we heard the cross proclaimed and we received Jesus in the supper. It is Monday morning and we've already been brought back into a Babylon worldview. And we're jostling for position. Making sure our colleagues know how hard we worked. Gossiping about another employee because we're insecure and worried they'll take our position. Wondering what other parents at school, the school gates are thinking and saying about us. Worrying if other children in the classroom like me or if I'm going to be, get to be with the cool gang. To be honest, it doesn't even have to be Monday morning, does it? Before we forget about it. It could be five minutes after the service is finished. And we've just heard the world-changing, mind-changing, life-changing message of the Almighty God who's come down and joined his creation, who came down from the glories of heaven and joined us in a life of poverty and pain, who came to suffer and die for you, asking nothing in return. The God who came to serve us and save us we can hear all of that literally moments later. Look at somebody else in church and be like, well, why aren't they doing what I'm doing? Why aren't they helping tidy up? Well, I'm better than them. Or, or I don't really need to tidy up. Everyone else seems to have it sorted. It's not really my thing. I've got more important things to do. That's just one example. We could, be, could list countless examples. Pride. Jostling for position, thinking less of others. It can happen in church. And actually, this is the central application of this passage. Arguments about greatness in church. Sure, we can, we can take this and we can apply it to attitudes at work and school and all those things. And that's fine and it's good that we think about how we act in those relationships. But the big deal is church life. You see... This passage isn't an argument about general greatness, about who's best at whatever. It's specifically pride in who serves God properly. There's a, there's a funny joke, isn't there? You know, um, two pastors and they're talking to each other and they go, you know, one says to the other, you know, we both serve God. Um, oh, this is why I shouldn't ad lib. I've forgotten the joke. You say, he, says, he says, you serve God, that's it, he says, you serve God in your way, in your own way, I serve God in his. So this idea, you know, we both serve God differently, you serve him in your own way, but I'm serving him in his. Yeah, we, we're like that, aren't we? I'm the one who serves God properly, I serve God better than you do. How messed up is that? And what's Jesus' answer to our petty, insecure, prideful posturing in church? Well, his answer is a child. So Jesus said, but Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Now you know how important to me and, and, and how big a deal we make at Hope Church of, of all the places in the Bible where Jesus speaks of children as being a model of faith. Uh, and how we must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, but this isn't actually one of those places. Um, Jesus is, isn't calling them to be like a child, a, generally like a child. But he's using this specific child as an example of how ministry and serving God works. So he says, whoever receives this child in my name 
receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, the Father. He's saying, if I sent this child in my name, the, per- the person who receives them will have received God. That's big, isn't it? He's saying, guys, cool it. I could use this child and apostle. If they go in my name, they bring life, the life of the Father, to the person who they go to. He's saying, it's not about you. It's not about any gift that you think you have or talents or attitudes. It's about my name. The power is in my name. It's in me. The moment you go out there and think you can do anything in your own name, in your own strength, from your own greatness without faith in me, is the moment you will fail. To think of yourself as great in the kingdom is to show that actually you are least. And those who have a realistic view of themselves before me, those who know they are least, and so come not with bravado, but come humbly, asking for life and help, to serve others and work in my name, well, they are the ones who are great. Jesus is saying, if you think you've got something to offer to God, you're nuts. You're crazy. In God's eyes, you are as incompetent as a three-year-old child. Now, three-year-old children can't cook or drive a car or earn money or carry heavy things or do skilled labor. They don't bring anything to the table, do they? Not by any scale would you call a three-year-old great. Well, in God's eyes, we are as incompetent as a three-year-old. And yet... And yet, he still loves us. And he still allows us to do his work. You know, he's like the father who lets lets us hold the hammer and be involved. He sends us out in his name. He empowers us and equips us so that we have the blessing of laboring with him, of ruling with him. See, we are the ones who we just receive. We are just empty vessels who receive. We receive the blessing as we serve in church life. He, Jesus, is the greatest. Anything good that comes to our life and ministry is all of him. And the fact that we go in his name, this applies to to, uh, the pastor and to every Christian. We must be careful to uh, never fall into the trap of thinking, wow, Jesus, you're so lucky to have me. Jesus, you're, you're so lucky to have a church like us. Jesus could remove us and send a child. An incompetent, powerless child sent in the name of Jesus is more effective, is greater than you or me working in our own name and all our adult knowledge and strength. And so John answers him in verse 49. Master... We saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Now, there's actually some different thoughts as to the nature of John's reply here. Some see John's comment as regret. Um, Is his conscience pricked by what Jesus said? He's kind of confessing, oh, well, we we did this thing, Jesus. Or, on the other hand, is, is John raising an objection? You know, kind of like, Well, that's a lovely speech, Jesus. It's all well and good talking about being least in the kingdom. uh, But surely the line has to be drawn somewhere. Surely there are some people who are less than us, right? For example, someone who doesn't even follow with us. Surely we're, we're greater than him. Either way, Jesus' response is the same. He says, those who are acting in good faith are not excluded. Those who are working in my name. See, there it is again, my name, are not to be stopped or opposed. And then, like like the disciples, our kind of ego rises up, but Lord, we are the ones who are serving you properly. We are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Your kingdom, Jesus, would surely be greater if everyone served you like we do. That sound familiar? I think we've probably all thought it at one time or another. You see, I think some Christians spend far too much time trying to stop people who will not work for Jesus in their way from working for Jesus at all. 
These the disciples were hardly in the position to stop somebody from doing the thing that they can't even do. The man was not against their ministry. They had no business in trying to stop him. In fact, their sin in trying to stop him was a greater sin than anything he might have not quite got right or been doing wrong. You see, we really need to get this. Other Christians are not the enemy. Hey, Satan is. Other Christians are not the enemy. Satan is. And we must do everything we can to encourage other Christians in their battle against him. We are in a holy alliance with all other Christians against the powers of darkness. And so Jesus says, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. The one who is not against you, is not actively against you, is for you. I think this is where a lot of Christians get confused. We confuse this saying of Jesus with another one in Matthew 12, verse 30, where he says, whoever is not with me is against me. So it's kind of the, the opposite side, you see. So here he says, if they're not against you, if they're not actively against you, then they're for you. But there he says, well, if they're not actively for me, then they are against me. At first glance, it seems that Jesus is being contradictory. But there's a huge piece of the puzzle that really clears this up for us, which I think a lot of Christians miss. One is about you, that is us, Christians, disciples. The other is about I, Jesus, the living God. We are not Jesus. Like, that, that's really important. We are in him. We are for him. We are loved by him. We are united with him. But each one of us individually is not the person of Jesus. Jesus is the most perfect and holy God. There is none like him. He alone brings the unique and perfect life of heaven down to earth. And so Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30, If you are not for me, this one who brings the life of heaven down to earth, then you are against me. There is no middle ground. There is no grey area. You are either in the kingdom of heaven or you are in the kingdom of the world, in Babylon's kingdom. And so if you do not promote and support his teaching, his view of reality, then you are against him. The same is not true of us. It is possible for somebody to be for Jesus, but not for you. Doesn't mean they're against you. It's really important. Okay? Okay. Just because they don't actively agree with you and all your teachings and all your views, just because they see things a different way, doesn't mean they're against you. doesn't mean they're the enemy. Just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean... Just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they disagree with God. And so the standard is lower for us than it is for the living God. If they are a Christian and they're not against you, as long as they are not actively against you, then treat them as though you're on the same team. Because you are. Oh, but duck, my doctrines are the doctrines of the living God. I follow you. I am right. I only speak what God has spoken. And of course, I speak it perfectly. Uh, and so to be against me is to be against the living God. Because I am the greatest theologian and servant of the Lord. My denomination and my tradition is right. Whoa. Yeah. Careful. Something I've been really challenged with over recently, uh, in the past few years particularly, is, is what we might call tribalism. Tribalism within Christianity, within the church. Particularly in evangelicalism. There seems to be more emphasis on separation than on unity. Um, we are quicker to talk about where we disagree with someone or some tradition than to speak of all the really important ways we totally agree. And I think there's too many divisions between genuine Christians. Too many churches emphasise and have what they call doctrinal distinctives. In other words, they, they kind of make a big deal about all the ways they disagree with other Christians. And other churches, and I think it's a little bit mad. And that's why I hope, church, to be a member, all you need to do is confess the Apostles' Creed, which any Christian can do. We agree on Jesus. 
We agree on him. He is the most important person. Like him, we agree on. What does anything else matter? It doesn't matter what political party you're from. Or, or, we are for him. Not some set of doctrines. Hang on, Doug. You're sounding a bit wishy-washy now. Don't you want church to be pure? Of course I do. But it can't be, because I'm in it. The church will not be pure until Jesus harvests her. There will always be some weeds among the wheat. And so Jesus is very careful to say, I'll be the one who says who's in and who's out. You don't. You see, Jesus sees the heart of man. We don't. Jesus knows who he has sent in his name. We don't. So, if they're not against you, leave it be. Jesus says to his church, don't go looking for Christians to be against. You don't know all the people I've called to work for me. Some of them will be like little children, simply going where I have told them. And they may seem weak and foolish to you, like a child, because I know, I know, Doug, I know you think you're big and you're strong and you're wise. But you're also a child that I've sent in my name. So, cool it. The one who is not against you is for you. Now, if they are against Jesus, then sure, then they are against us and actually we are against them. We will speak against that. If they are denying Jesus, if they are denying that he is God, if they are denying his resurrection, if they are denying the Trinity, if they are calling him a sinner, if they are rejecting the gospel, sure, of course, we're not with those people. They're not Christians. Obviously. We're not talking about that, are we? We're talking about Christians who come in here and stand with us and confess the Nicene Creed and confess the Apostles' Creed. We're talking about people who are doing ministry in Jesus' name. And often effectively, I might add. And that's the bit that really irks us. They're doing it differently to us, but they seem to be having more, more fruit. We need to have a generosity of spirit. Here at Hope Church, we know what it is to change our minds, don't we? Even on important things. We know what it is to say, oh, I was wrong about that. So we must always be ready to acknowledge that we might be wrong. That we might, we might be the ones who change our minds. If someone is not for you, for your view, you could be the one that's wrong. That is a strong possibility. Whether it be baptism or creation or women ordination or church government, whatever it may be. Yes, we are going to have a strong conviction on what we believe. And we're going to preach it. And hold firmly to it. Because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. But don't go looking for people to be against. If we agree on Jesus, on who he is, and what he has done, then we are for each other. Jesus is the only one who never has to change his mind. Bear that in mind. He's never wrong. We must avoid the church tribalism that believes that we are the only church that serves God properly. I have a Doug. Somebody will be right and somebody will be wrong. So who's the greatest? Jesus. Jesus. And we don't need to work out. We, 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 are, we take things very carefully, very seriously. We practice how we believe the Bible teaches. In that sense, we'll work out what we think is right. We don't have to work out between brothers who's one day we'll find out and a lot of us will be eating humble pie. Jesus is greatest. Jesus is. And the rest of us are just foolish children who go out in his name and, and make a mess of stuff and yet he still blesses and loves us and, and blesses our weak endeavours for him. So let's just round this up. The aim isn't to think less of yourself. It is to think of yourself less. I said that at the beginning. That's actually wrong. In fact, the aim is not to think less of yourself. It's not to think of yourself less. It's just to dwell on Jesus. Like actively dwell on him. It's really hard to think of yourself less because you're like, oh, am, I thinking, am I thinking of myself? Or are you thinking of myself less? And in the process, you're thinking of yourself. 
You need to actively replace that with something better. A vision of Jesus. So focus on him. Think much of him and the beauty of his cross. You see, the cross kills our pride. When we look at the cross, we see what true greatness is. Not elevating ourselves, but dying to self and dying for others. The cross destroys our insecurities. Because as we see the cross, we see the living God's love for us. If Jesus loves you that much, it doesn't really matter if you're in the cool crowd, does it? We don't need to scramble to the top of the pile. The cross obliterates tribalism. Because we look at the cross, we see the person we agree on. And we see on the cross the humanity that we're all a part of being judged and destroyed. And being shown to be foolish. Like, my, my foolishness is just the same as the guy down the road's foolishness. And it all need to be dealt with. We don't need to lift ourselves up because we have been raised up in Jesus. When we keep the cross central, when we keep Jesus central, when we learn from him and listen to him, our lives make sense. We are secure and loved and we're put in our right mind and we see the world for what it is and we're freed to love even those who disagree with us. It's only when we look away from the cross, so it's only when we look away from ourselves and to Jesus and his cross, only then do we see true greatness. So keep your eyes fixed on him. Follow him and you will experience true greatness greatness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.